did for doing that, Craig. And it shows you that our money is well spent. Absolutely. On those Absolutely. iPads, right. and uh, we're all wow. learning from that. Mm -hmm. Even some of us who've been out of school for many years, but I see the second grade at Peter Road School yeah. is a lot more sophisticated than when I was. I would second say grade. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, that was great. That okay. was terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next item we have on our agenda here is uh, the transfer of the Woodbridge Country photos to the Jewish Historical Society. And Marvin uh, Barger is here, if you'd like to come up, and uh, I'll just give you uh, one. We, we have a whole box full of these, but this is from the club of officers and board members in 2003. <coughs> and we have, going back all the way to 1959, we're going to keep the 1959 one to, at the Country Club of Woodbridge, okay. but uh, we're honored to give you these photos and hope you'll uh, preserve them. Well, we do preserve them. I just want to tell you, you know, the Jewish historical the Jewish Historical Society of Greater New Haven. Our mission is to document the history of the Jewish community, and as you all know, the Woodbridge Country Club was started by a group of Jewish uh, businessmen. You know, no longer exist. But this is what we do. We document this. This will be cataloged. You'll get an acknowledgement. I must say that this was. I was made aware of this by one of our members, David uh, Cohen. Everybody here seems to know. But uh, as I said. We'll take good care of it, and it will be acknowledged here. And I thank you very much. It's a very welcome addition to our archives. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, yep. guys. Yep. Okay, so. <laughs> Dr. Stull, you can now, uh, you're there the next person on the agenda, so you can make your report on the uh, Beecher Road School. You can supplement what we just witnessed there. Well, how can I follow? It's a tough fact to follow. I'll tell you, they were amazing. And um, don't take this in the wrong way, but there was uh, the energy level and the excitement in the room. I have never seen it uh, the way it was. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, and thank, thank you for the opportunity for our children to have an audience. That's very, very important that children have an audience within the school and without the school. And the phrase developmentally appropriate takes on another significance when you see children, second graders, working on a sophisticated, sophisticated uh, unit on town government, coming together with essential questions, doing research and reading and writing and so on, creating shared stories, and then using multiple modalities uh, to create a uh, production um, for an outside aud audience, but also allowing them in pairs and teams to analyze their own oral presentation, their speaking, their reading, their fluency, and so on and their ability to build and extend vocabulary. So, so you've given a good example of, uh, of uh, helping young children. And as I said before, when we plant seeds in, in the minds of our youngest children, that's what influences them later on. Someone becomes an engineer because someone allowed them to t tinker around when they were young in, in grade school and so on. Someone becomes a teacher because they had the opportunity of sharing and teaching with others and so on, and it goes on and on. A wonderful example. I'll, I'll try to condense some of my presentation. We, you know, you heard, you've heard of the raising of a barn, I guess, in the Amish country and so on. Well, we had the raising of a playground that took place on March 31st. It was a, a, a wonderful sight. I'll pick, a, pick one day on that weekend, a Sunday. You could see people coming in their work clothes, uh, men and women, um, all professions and so on, either wheel, taking wheeling wheelbarrows, bringing shovels, rakes, hoes, in a community project to build a playground for children. And um, there, there were dozens of people. We, we want to thank Bree and Jason Fennick Becker, who really took a charge of this here in the PTO, but also many staff members, including uh, Anthony Taddy and Larry Hurwitz, who worked round the clock uh, on building this playground. It not only created community, but it saved the taxpayer, I would say, anywhere from ten to $15,000. And uh, we had a ribbon cutting this last <coughs> Monday. The first selectman was very kind in coming there to help with the ribbon cutting. Uh, the excitement uh, was in the air as the children sat, hundreds of them surround, looking at the playground, just waiting. The ribbon was cut, and then a class of children just, uh, should I say, charged, <laughs> kind of ran, ran swiftly towards the uh, playground and demonstrated to their, to their peers safe use of the playground. 
that's an important part of it. So, so that's that's a report on that. Uh, principal search. What I'll tell you now because I, I have to report to the board of education. We're in the process of a principal search, and um, I hope to bring a recommendation to the school board by the May meeting or before. And we have a, a committee of uh, 15, a very representative com committee of 15 people, uh, including parents and um, members of the board, staff members, administrators, uh, coming together and using collective wisdom to come up with someone who would be a good leader for the school. <coughs> the principals of the parents, uh, superintendents, parents curriculum academy, that's, um, that, that's a, a, an excuse to bring parents together for a dialogue concerning uh, and bring them closer to school. We have a session tomorrow night from 6 to 8 o'clock, and the topic will be Readers and Writers Workshop. What is it? What's the rationale? What does it look like in the classroom? What kind of, what kind of impact does it have on children? It takes a look at children's work and so on. And uh, we have two invited consultants from Columbia's uh, Reading and Writing Project coming up to present at that time. Uh, next week, uh, we all have to demonstrate, children demonstrated that they, were, they, they are leaders of learning, and we as adults have to do the same. So during the vacation week, uh, I will be joining four to five school board members, and we're taking a drive uh, up to Boston for the National School Board Conference. It's, a, it's, quite, it's a premier a convention across the country, and I think we'll bring back some new learning. But, uh, as always, I want to thank the support, the town, for all the support that they give uh, to our school district and to our school. You could see the results of, uh, of your support here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then following up with more on the Beecher Road School, we're going to have a presentation of the traffic flow design for Beecher uh, North from uh, Luke's Associates. And, uh, Hi, good evening. Where would it be best to put the easement? Would here work? I think that's that's good. Yep. <coughs> well, good evening. It's a tough act to follow after the second grade, but I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, we were charged by the town and the school with a design of improvements to the north parking lot, both to the operations and more importantly to the safety of the drop-off area. We met with the school staff back in the fall and since then have completed a survey of the entire area. Can I go over there? With sure. The pick that up? Okay, but of the entire area and our main focus really was the drop-off area. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing we, we noticed after interviewing the crossing guard and the policeman that, that uh, works there in the morning is that the area where the parents actually drop off the children <coughs> is very limited. The cars parked upstream and downstream from the drop off area. So the first thing we propose, are proposing to do is eliminate those parking spaces to provide a much longer area where parents can drop off their children. This will obviously speed up the whole process and eliminate the long, long line that is uh, present here pretty much every morning. Uh, so we are proposing a wide sidewalk, concrete sidewalk, all the way from here to here, which will enable at least five or six cars to go through the dropping off children uh, in the morning. And in addition, we are proposing a curved median here to separate this activity from the parking lot itself which is absent today. Today it's, it's a kind of a free-for-all. This mimics the same arrangement we have implemented some years ago in the South School where there's a median that separates the drop-off activity from the cars traveling. Uh, one of our biggest charges was do not eliminate, do not reduce the number of spaces in the parking lot. And that was a challenge because we, as I said, we did eliminate a few here. So what we've done is we've reduced somewhat these islands without the, removing the trees. The trees are there, but the grass area will be limited so that when all is said and done, actually we have gained one spot, one space throughout the parking area. <coughs> what we've also done is we've increased the number of handicapped 
spaces here so it complies to the codes and the sidewalk along here will be depressed to enable the wheelchairs to, to go and cross safely. Today there's a pedestrian crossing here that's kind of distracting and does not serve and we propose to eliminate it. In order to focus the, the entryway, the, the everything funnels here, we are proposing to have this pavement as stand concrete looking brick-like without being brick, so for maintenance purposes it's better. But the look of this area will draw the, the activity to the main entrance to the school. Uh, this area here we're proposing to be a biofiltration swale, which means that all this runoff, that today the parking lot grades this way, which is fine, <coughs> and all the water goes underground into the uh, stormwater system, this area will enable the sediments to be filtered naturally in the grass and end up in the catch basin. Um, so that's one improvement we're proposing <coughs> here. Throughout this whole area, we're proposing new concrete curves. Uh, those are very important. Today, they have bituminous curves. At first, the snow clouds tend to peel off, so many of them are missing, which in turn allows many parents to park on the medians where they shouldn't. So the concrete curves are what we would call non-mountable. They're not easy to go over, which we hope will stop parents from going over them and parking where they shouldn't. These were, are also much more durable as far as snow removal and uh, standing up to the snow clouds. Uh, finally, we are, uh, finally but importantly, we are proposing uh, many uh, enhancements to the streetscape, to the landscaping in this area, trees, bushes, and so on. We have used the good services of Tom Tavella, who works extensively with the school and has a good rapport with the school administration, knows what their taste is uh, to conform to what they wish this to look like. Um, and finally, we are proposing to stripe the whole area and sign it to make sure that the flow is very clear and no drivers drive the wrong way. Uh, one element that we introduced more recently is we're proposing to move traffic down the <coughs> hill to enable buses to go around. Many times you see in the morning private cars waiting to drop the children are blocking buses from approaching their uh, dedicated drop-off zone. So with arrows, with signs, keep left. We are proposing to uh, clear the way for the buses. The price tag, the preliminary cost estimate for these improvements without the payment of the actual parking lot comes to about $150,000. We're proposing this improvement with a biofiltration system here as an add-on, which we expect it will be in the neighborhood of probably $8,000, but because we don't know how low or high the bids will come in, uh, we're proposing it as an option, which hopefully we can, we can uh, include. We have priced the paving of this entire area, and that is in the neighborhood of about $250,000, $300,000, which is way beyond the total $200,000 grant that this town had received. Um, mm -hmm. For the same reason, our initial hope to provide lighting clearly is not within the, the budget of this project. It is certainly possible to include it later. What we focused on is providing the, the bones to, to the improvements of the, both safety and flow where the paving can come later. As far as the schedule, we are planning to have it advertised in and around May to enable us to have the contract to be ready as soon as school is out. It is gonna be a scheduling challenge because on the one hand, the school has summer activities at the beginning of the summer on the other hand, we know that the contractor must be out by the end of August. So our goal is to be ready with a bid, with prices. Once the bids come in, we can sit down with the Tony and uh, the school and see, can we add this? How can we accommodate paving? But uh, 
At this time, it is anticipated that within about four to six weeks, weeks during the summer, this project can be constructed. And with that, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Do you have any questions of Ron? Is there any lighting now in the parking lot? Yes, there is lighting. Where is the lighting now? Lighting is along here. There's a, one element here that's missing because cars like to climb the curb. But generally, there are lighting along here. Oh, no. Remember now, we, in addition to the wider sidewalk, we're proposing some benches here which will serve the students as they wait for it. Any other questions? So you help to accomplish this over the summer, Ron? Definitely. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank for the you. presentation. Okay, the next item on our agenda is a personnel committee report, actually by the Board of Selectmen. And uh, so, uh, Tony, you want to give a report on the personnel committee uh, we met this afternoon? Sure. There were uh, one action was to. Um, I'm just finding my paperwork here. We have a um, two part-time positions in um, human services office, and the um, personnel committee reviewed the budget. And the um, the two part-time positions are probably total 48 hours, and they're proposal by Human Services was to create one position uh, for 40 hours, which would result in savings to the town um, as a result of um, the uh, reduced hours. Uh, but more importantly, it would be efficiency uh, within the department, which was, we felt really, uh, was a really important idea uh, based on um, having two part-timers with programs, coordinating programs, coordinating budgets, coordinating time, Etc. Um, proves to be somewhat inefficient. So uh, that was the proposal. The um, person, that one of the who's in the, one of the part-time uh, positions, would be offered the full-time position, and um, she does not need uh, benefits. So that would not be a cost to the town either. So um, based on those um, those um, that presentation, the uh, personnel committee had um, agreed to uh, put this forward. So that's the recommendation of the personnel committee, and that the money to pay for this is within the budget. It's within the budget, as a matter of fact, it's, <coughs> it's about five thousand dollars saved, okay. actually. So I'd entertain a motion to approve the recommendation of the personnel committee for a full-time administrative assistant to the director of human services, as outlined by uh, Tom. So second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Passes unanimously. And uh, Dave Ryan is here, our uh, labor consultant, to give us an update on the contract with the town hall employees and the police department. Uh, we have just uh, concluded two collective bargaining agreements uh, with our unions that will go until uh, July of 2014. We had, if you'll recall, a already approved a police contract some months ago. <coughs> we reached a tentative agreement with our AFSCME union, which represents uh, all the clerical, uh, public works, dispatchers, and so forth uh, in the town hall area. <coughs> they, however, uh, claimed that they did not know what they <coughs> voted on, so they filed a charge against the town uh, to try to halt negotiations. And we countercharged, uh, accusing the union of bad faith bargaining. And as a result of that, we had two meetings um, with people from the State Board of Labor Relations. And the result of it is that uh, we offered a choice to the union. And the choice was to reduce the managed care section of our insurance in return for the union uh, giving up a half a percent uh, wage increase this coming October and a quarter percent increase in the last year of the contract. And we, from the town perspective, uh, thought they would vote to save the money, but they did not. They voted uh, to give up the money. On balance, uh, the town does very well in this exchange. 
So I'm recommending that that change be accepted. After that was voted on, since we have an outstanding relationship also with the police department, um, we did not open the contract because that could have led to a disaster. Uh, however, we offered them the choice to vote on the same <coughs> choices that were given to the AFSCME union. They voted the same way as the AFSCME union, so we're all going to be in one insurance program. I can represent to you that as a result of both negotiations, the town has done well in the area of insurance over the next several years, especially in the first two years of the contract, which Tony can support. Uh, and the most recent change actually winds up being very favorable to the town of Woodbridge. Uh, in addition, I think that the, the change has uh, alleviated a lot of pressure in the minds of several employees in town. Uh, we've always subscribed to positive employee relations and I think this total exercise will lead to pretty sound relations for the next three or four years with all of our employees. Okay, so what we would need to do then is to approve the contract with the town hall employees as amended as you described it. That's correct. correct. And the change made to the police contract. Okay. So I entertain a motion to that effect. So moved. So. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. One abstention. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is a report from the Woodbridge Animal Control, and Deputy Chief Ray Stewart is here. Morning, how are you? Doing? <laughs> still uh, late. Uh, yeah, it's been a long day. <laughs> uh, before I get started, I just want to recognize uh, Karen Lombardi. She's one of our ACOs. She's in the, in the audience, so just to, in case you had any questions of her. Um, Back in February, I was asked by, by Tony and, and First Leckman to uh, put a, together an overview of you know, what's going on about the animal control. Um, and with the figures that I got, I just want you to, to understand that um, uh, what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to get it all into one records management system with the police department, under the, uh, the auspice of the police department. Uh, but in, in trying to do that report for, for Tony, you know, we, I recognized, uh, you know, working with Karen, that, that you know there was a lot of forms. A lot of there's state forms. There's there's uh, logs that they keep down at the animal um, control, and then there's uh, our actual records management system at the police department that we're trying to incorporate. It. So I had to use those three three things to get a lot of the information that we we obtained. Um, but what it showed, and this will be a period from September 2011 until the end of January of 2012. Uh, hopefully in the near future I'll be able to provide the same type of information to Tony on a regular basis, whether it be, you know, quarterly, you know, biannually or whatever, however they decide they want to do it. Um, but in the, in the first two months that we really weren't collecting what I felt was a, 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 a clear sense of what they were doing down there, uh, we were probably averaging about uh, 60 calls a month. Um, Between Bethany and Woodbridge, uh, it seemed like um, uh, Bethany impounds were in September were eight. Woodbridge was at thirteen. So it's 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 about close to being the being the same. Um, going into the November, December, and January periods, um, we looked at you know some of their job responsibilities and a lot of the work that was being done, and the average of the months went actually actually went up to about ninety five. Because we saw that, that in September, in the earlier months, what we were doing is we were only recording when they were called out. So if they, if they got a call at the PD or they got a call through Animal Control where an actual card was punched uh, through the PD and they would go out and act on that. But we found out that there, a lot of people were going down to the Animal Control and they were dealing with those with, with adoptions, bringing in dogs. So that's, that's where the extra calls are coming in, which are legitimate calls and it's work that they're doing down there. So I, I think what we're doing is we're showing them, uh, you know, a better idea of, of the volume of work that's that's uh, that's being done at the animal control. Uh, overall, the bucket, the budget, uh, and working knowledge and operations uh, of the police fire administration has learned that the facility, you know, uh, is in need of some repairs. 
Uh, we've recognized that fact. We know that that's going to be a budgetary item. Uh, uh, there's some you know significant uh, things that have to be that have already been done that need to be done down there. Uh, we're working together uh, with the finance uh, to get those things taken care of. Um, I mean, if you needed to know specifics, I do have them. Uh, we did, in fact, just receive a report from uh, the state animal control in inspecting those that our facility. Uh, not that it can't handle the dogs, but they did identify some deficiencies. And those were deficiencies, I think, that we were already <coughs> aware of and that the town was already working on to, to make better. Uh, you know, we've worked with animal control in trying to uh, fulfill their needs as far as their schedule goes. Because uh, it was a, I think it was a little <coughs> bit of a, a change for them when, when the police department took it over. And uh, I think Karen would probably agree with that. Uh, but we're trying to work with them to, to make it, you know, uh, better for them as well as, you know, doing the job that uh, they're required to do. Um, so just so everyone can remember it, on July 1st, the town of Woodbridge took over the animal control, the district animal control, which it consisted of Orange, uh, Bethany, Orange, and Woodbridge uh, was dissolved. Bethany joined us on a, on a contractual basis, and so they would be working together going forward on that. You shared these, uh, this report with the uh, first select Mangorski, I believe, with yes, Bethany. I did. Yeah. Okay. So does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, just one quick question. Is there any way to compare the call volume that, that you've identified with a prorated call volume when it was a district town of animal control? It was, um, it was the three towns. It was Beacon Falls, I think. It was Prospect. The no, Prospect, Prospect withdrew, and then uh, Orange withdrew. Right. Uh, and I, and I, I don't even know if there's any value in that. I'm just wondering if you... Um, in our benefit, I don't, I don't think there really is any, any value in it. I think it would be very difficult to go back and, and, and try to determine uh, the significance in the two because I think they're they're doing a, a lot of things differently than they did before. Um, I, I think it's being run a little bit more efficiently. Um, I think that it, it's tested. You know, there, we don't have a lot of complaints about the animal control. Uh, I mean, I can credit that to the maybe the, to the, how the personnel are working down there, uh, how the job's being done, how it's being supervised. I mean, we have a uh, we have a sergeant that oversees them, the sergeant at. at answers to the lieutenant in our department. So there's a ch chain of command, uh, specifically within the police department. Uh, again, like I said, it's, it was a big change. Uh, it was a big change for them. Um, and I commend them for, you know, uh, I mean, there was complaints, but you know, they, they, they're working with us and I think it's going along pretty smooth right now. I mean, there's a lot of things that still have to be done um, and hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll get better. Um, I think the biggest problem right now is, is the facility itself. Right. It's not about. I was going to ask that about that now. in terms of going forward. Do we have? Are we at the point now where we have any proposals or anything for any repairs or what's we'll necessary? How are we going to do that? Proposal for one of your future, probably in the, hopefully your next meeting to okay. come up with a more comprehensive yeah. proposal okay. on that. Yeah, the most significant need down there. Right. Right. Is, yeah. Okay. But the, the, the state right. comes down and inspects it twice a year, so uh, we're going to try to you know, stay on top of that. Okay. So those Bethany calls are about 50-50? Um, not, not quite, not quite. I mean, it, I think they'll, they would admit that there, there's, there's a significant amount of calls. I mean, just, I'll, I'll just take one month just so we don't ha have to get into it. Uh, let's, let's take uh, what's the best? I mean, December, you know, it's, it's a non-month. Bethany calls, they had nine impacts. That's when they, they, we take calls, I mean, we, we go out and we take uh, dogs in from Bethany. Uh, total calls in Bethany were 19. Woodbridge had 15 in pounds. All right. Total calls in Woodbridge were were uh, were 68. I mean, uh, and it averages about that. So it, it's. So you you have that report there, uh, Ray. You can share that with the board of salt. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm so totally can, you have a copy with you. Is that usage what um, we projected in terms of the Bethany use versus the Woodbridge use, or? I didn't. No, I didn't actually. You know, break it down to in that respect. Like next year, we'll yeah. probably try and make a projection based on the use. Is that how? Is that how we'll determine yeah, what Bethany's? Jerry, why? I wanted you to comment just, on the contract. To the best of my recollection, we did this agreement when when we started in July, and and they pay us a set fee plus usage over a certain amount of calls. So we built in mm -hmm. some protection for the town if Bethany really goes pretty high. 
and I don't know what the numbers are. I don't know whether they've exceeded it or whether they've been below it, but <laughs> if they really start u using the they, system. They have not exceeded it. They have not exceeded it. Yeah. I mean, the number of months is about 50-50. I mean, in November, it was it was 23 calls versus 46. You know, uh, January, it was, it was 19 to 29. Uh, it really does jump around a little bit. Uh, like I said, those those three months, the average is about 95 calls. Total. For both, for both towns. Total. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Total. Okay. Any other questions? If not, if you could just leave a copy of that with the jury and then she'll make copies for everyone uh, okay. on the Board of Selectors. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Next item on our agenda is a request from the Masaro Farm Board to approve a letter sanctioning the expansion of fields and Jason Ball is here. Jason, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, I thought I'd come out and just provide a little bit of background info about uh, what the letter uh, is asking. Um, it's a new grant from the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. The Masaro Community Farm is applying for it and part of the grant stipulates that the owner of the property be notified uh, and in agreement with the nature of the grant. Um, if funding is approved from the state, the purpose is to remove invasive species, stumps, and boulders from two of the fields on the farm. Uh, if you stand at the farm with Ford Road at your back and the barn on your left, it's the fields angling out diagonally towards the dairy barn. Um, it's the Bigger of the fields, uh, field three is identified on the original map as a 16-acre field, and field two is a five-acre field. Um, if we get the funding for that, we'll be able to clear the land, uh, hopefully bring approximately 21 acres back under control, uh, and turn it into hopefully some production of some type. What's considered an invasive species? Um, like the uh, barberry. Um, I saw Kathy back there. Kathy is bittersweet. Bittersweet is another good example. Um, typically, it's a plant that will seed itself on a bare field, and it's the first growth that comes back. Normally, it's not a native species. The native species tend to get overrun by the invasives. Uh, invasives is what most people call them. But that's just a couple examples. Uh, and I can tell you that there is barberry all over the farm, so eradicating it is difficult. But one of the purposes of this. Does anyone have any questions? I, I had a question. Uh, when I read this, Jason, I thought it was a terrific idea. I think, personally, I'd love to see more of that property come into production. Um, but I just had a question. Uh, invasive species, certainly, but in terms of uh, habitat for Native species, animal, mm -hmm. and birds. Absolutely. Uh, is there any consideration about, uh, well, habitat destruction? <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's always something we are keenly aware of at the farm. We, we do want to preserve and protect the, the native flora and fauna as much as possible, uh, while at the same time turning the farm back into a productive facility for, for the community. Um, as you know, the farm is over 57 acres. Um, of which over half of it will still remain native and wild. Um, in fact, we're coordinating with the Girl Scouts right now to put in some walking trails and hiking trails on the property to allow people to come out and actually explore the, the nature that's st still there um, and will remain in place. To try to strike a balance. Here. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just an idea of other funds that we've received from the NRCS and Department of Ag. Um, our transition, transition to organic practices is funding that we've received. Um, brush management along the northern portion of the farm, um, including the stream crossing that actually the Masaros had built years ago <coughs> between two fields for the cattle crossings. Um, water diversion, uh, we're always mindful for uh, erosion of the soils, so the NRCS is helping provide funding for a water diversion to maintain the fields and keep them from washing away and other conservation practices around the highly erodible fields right along the top of the property by Ford Road. So uh, this is just uh, more funding available to us to continue the practices that we're using. Any other questions or comments? No, I guess you're asking us tonight, Jason, is to approve this draft letter in support of the application? Correct. So in your packet we have that draft letter uh, and so I'd entertain a motion to 
approve that letter uh, in support of the Massaro Farm Grant application to the Department of Agriculture. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. Have a great Thank, night. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Next item on our agenda is uh, public comments. Do you have any comments? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm sorry the assistant chief left. I have uh, two questions dealing with the shelter. Um, can, does anybody know what the current hours of operation are? The, uh, we can get you that information. Okay. Uh, after hours. Karen? There were calls coming in. I'm sorry, Karen, leave. She left. She left too. Karen's still here. Everybody's gone? Um, how are calls handled after hours? My understanding is that uh, it, sometimes the police handle the call, and other times they call in the animal control officer, depending on the circumstances. So the police contact the ACO when the call comes in, is that correct? Yeah, I believe that's the case, yes. Is a log kept as to how many calls come to the station after hours? Uh, I, I can't say I know that from my personal knowledge, but knowing how the police department operates, I would assume so. so they keep would, records of everything, so. So that would be available to the board, to the public, anybody in the community? Well, actually, the, the, the consistent chief is oh. There he is. Yay. There, 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 there. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were there. We were just discussing that. There you go. Hours of operation is right in that camp right there. They, they do, if they have, uh, we were working on something decided that it wasn't needed through some of the paperwork we had. You're, you're the chief control officer. <laughs> Why don't you repeat your question again? The first question was hours of operation. And if the hours have been reduced, I guess the addendum to that would be if the hours have been reduced, how does the call-ins reflect the reduction of hours as opposed to when they were receiving calls seven days a week, I believe? Well, in our, in our report, we did in fact look, look at what, what Sundays. That was one of the questions that, that, that the final director wanted me to look into. How many calls are on Saturday? How many calls are on Sunday? And there was an issue with working with the, with the employees down there that they, did, that they did in fact have to be working in there on Sundays. So we, after looking at that, we, we felt that there was, we could give Sundays off because the, the shelter's closed on Sundays anyways. But we, we and originally, administratively, had somebody work. We split it up. so. Somebody was working on something to pick up some of those calls. Because there was, in fact, there is calls that, that we have to call them out on Sunday. Uh, I don't know what the, the average is, maybe <laughs> two to three. Um, but we looked at that, we could give them Sundays off. So the, the, the facility is closed on Sundays, and it's closed on Monday. Oh. All right? And the hours and of all operation? All the other six days, there, there we have someone working there either seven to three or 11 to seven at night. You mean the other five days of the week, other than Actually Sunday, six Monday? days. Okay. On, on Mondays, we have somebody there from 7 to 3, correct, Karen? Okay. And, and what happens to the calls that come in after hours? I assume they go to the police department. They and go to the police department. I actually broke that down, too, and, that, and that's in here. I said there is times when an officer will take the call if it's something that they can handle. Uh, it, it could be animal related, and we could call them out. If the officers feel uncomfortable, you know, with the dog that they have to pick up or something like that, they'll, they'll call the animal patrol out to, to, to pick them up. If they feel they can handle it, they can put it in the back of the car. There's a, they have the capabilities of bringing them down to the, to the uh, facility and dropping them off there. They can lock them up and everything. So as, as far as the police department, we're trying to get a little bit more control on how it's trying to save a little money. I think we have. Uh, I'm hoping that, it, that answers your question as far as... You know, we, we try to get the most coverage out of the two full-time employees that we have. I, th I think we've done that pretty efficiently. And allowing them to have, have days off at the same time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Ray. Any other members of the public? Chuck Pine, 162 Center Road. It, maybe it's more of a question than a comment. Regarding the um, golf club budget that was passed and the expenditures that we're now 
committing ourselves to. How does that square up with us having an annual town meeting and an annual budget where the town approves such things? Um, clearly the expenditures are over the $50,000 threshold that are cited in the town charter. And my understanding is that some of those expenses are gonna hit well before the July 1 start of the next fiscal year. So how did we not have a special meeting of the town to talk about those expenditures that were approved last meeting? <clears throat> On May 23rd, the entire budget, which will include parts of the Country Club of Woodbridge operations, will be presented to the annual meeting of the town, at which time it will be discussed and hopefully approved. Uh, until that time, Billy Casper Associates had advanced $100,000 under the agreement with the town to maintain operating operations for this period of time. The town has approximately 150,000 yeah, left, 125, left from golf operations in prior years. We anticipate that that will be enough to keep the club operating between now and May 23rd, and even perhaps July 1, without having to advance any monies. In addition to those revenues, there are revenues that are being generated by golfers right now that are being used by Casper to meet current expenses. But that, that's a cash flow situation. I'm talking about the approval of an expenditure, whether we have the cash in the, month, in the bank or not. I think it goes back to an expenditure that has to be approved, right? It's gonna be approved on May 23rd. No, 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 okay, but that's, that's the future. We're sitting here now, still in April, and we're cutting checks now no, we aren't cutting checks. No, it's not, check. not, Billy Casper hasn't received a dime. No, they have received a dime. They've received $50,000 from the town. Okay. Out of the funds that came from prior years of golf operations, which were outside the budget. We do, we also anticipate that there will be a surplus over operating expenses during the entire course of the season. So we're hopeful, while there's no guarantee, we're hopeful that the, expe that the expenditures will be less than the revenues. So there will not be any appropriations by the town. Okay, you, but you're, you're, you're mixing cash flow. I'd be, with, happy to talk, I'd be happy to talk to you privately about after the meeting, but I don't think it's gonna be useful for you and I to have a discussion about the budget. We have also consulted with bond council the town, for the town. We've also consulted with the auditors of the town, and they've told us that, that, that the procedure that we're doing is permissible and acceptable under the charter. Keep in mind, at the town meeting in, in um, 2009, when the town approved the purchase of the country club, mm -hmm. there was a provision in that resolution that was brought before the special town meeting, which gave the Board of Selectmen the authority to run the club for recreational purpose, educational purposes. <coughs> that was a broad grant to the, to the Board of Selectmen by the townspeople for the purpose of, that, of the country club. That grant could essentially told the, to the Board of Selectmen, you need to do something with this club, we can't let it go fallow, and we gotta keep the golf course in operation. So the answer to your question is we have not written a check, as far as I know, other than money from the country club operations in prior years. Casper has advanced $100,000, and we're hopeful that that gets us through the May meeting. Okay, and what again, happens if it's, okay. Uh, I, you know, I, I, there's gonna be a lot of questions for you, uh, Chuck, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it, but I don't think <laughs> it's useful for us to get into a discussion arguing the-, well, the I'm uh, not, I, it's not an argument, I'm, I'm asking questions in the second, uh, and I, okay, okay, and, that, and that's great, so you, okay. you, you, you feel comfortable, you have your ducks in a row as to where you are financially vis-a-vis -vis the town charter right now, granted. Correct. We have a meeting, town meeting on May 23rd. What happens if that budget doesn't pass? Well, if the town doesn't want to support the golf club and wants the $7 million investment to go down to a million dollar value, I guess that's something that the Board of Select and the Board of Finance will have to address at that time. Jerry, I, I, for, for you to characterize it that way just reeks of, of a political agenda. So I'm going to ask the question no, I don't from a process, have a political agenda. I'm please, telling you what from the a process is. perspective. From a process perspective. I'm asking you as a town council. Not, not your opinion about the value shrinking. From a process perspective, if the town doesn't pass that budget that has the golf course money embedded in it, 
what happens to those commitments that we've already made to Billy Casper Golf and to the leasing company and to whomever else? Now listen to me carefully. I'm going to try. If the town doesn't approve the budget and doesn't want to sustain the golf course operations and the investment we made, mm -hmm. the Board of Selectmen will have to determine how to best handle those investments. I can't speculate on what will happen as a result of it not passing. I'm optimistic and hopefully the town, as well as you, have, have a lot of confidence in this operation because it's the only thing we can do at this point. We're all hopeful that the town backs it and, and, and gives us the opportunity to make this thing successful. And I think that's the answer. Okay, I'm concerned. Hope is not a strategy, by the way. There is no guarantee. Listen, I, we're all concerned. We're, there is no guarantee. Everybody is working very hard to make this very successful. We have representatives of Casper who will give us a report. And I think initially, although there's no guarantees long term, initially we're, we're happy. I'll wear a helmet. I'm and concerned. again, I'll be happy to you give me a call tomorrow. We'll talk. We'll go over this. You know, it's, it's not that you don't have some valid concerns, as we all do. But I'd like to discuss it with you, if you want. You got it. Okay. Talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. So, any other members of the public have any comments? Hi, Anthony Anastasio, Jeremy Garden. Uh, I just want to clarify that a little bit. It was mixing apples and oranges a little bit for me. <clears throat> I'm confused as to the contracts we entered for both the financing and the leasing of equipment golf carts. If a budget doesn't pass, how do we turn back the clock on those two issues? Yeah. The, the, those, first of all, those contracts have not been signed, but they're on the way. Okay. Second of all, it's very standard when a municipality enters into a contract for leases, as we do for copying machines and other equipment that the town has, there's so, it's what is called a non-appropriation clause in it. That is a condi condition of the town going forward. If a funds are not appropriate by the town, the vendor cannot expect us to pay it. So we so have the, not entered so that yet. We have, but there were those non-appropriation clauses have been agreed to by the leasing companies, and they will be in the document when we sign them. And you may sign it before the budget, but you're saying we may they, sign it. Yes, we, we have to listen. There's a practical reality here. We need to operate that golf course, and yes, it may be signed be, be signed before the budget. Okay, and that handles the leasing and the financing. On the last meeting when I, when we were here, the finance board met with uh, at the end of the approval of the budget. There were, the next sentence was, when do we get together, we have to talk about capital expenditures for the golf course. I'm going to ask and I'll go take a seat. Can you somehow fill us in on if those capital expenditures were discussed? And since they weren't part of the budget, just as I understand there was some thirty or 35000 spent on the pool that was not part of that budget, it did not show up as capital expenditure. I think there was only 20000 that was shown, and that was right. for some tree removal. Tree right. 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 Yep. Uh, so that part wasn't included, even though it's part of this golf course expenditure for the town. It may not be for that budget. Um, I was just wondering if there's any type of report or if the selectmen were prepared at one point to tell us a little more about the capital expenditure meeting. No, there, there hasn't been a report uh, generated as of yet, but. Um, but there's not going to be, we, we don't anticipate any capital expenditure. No, that won't budget. be included in any type of golf course budget, but. For the overview of the town, it's well. You're asking: Have there been any capital expenditures made since that last meeting? Is that no? The, at, at the end of the that, you want to know if there's a five-year capital plan for the yeah? Budget. There was going to be discussions of the capital expenditures and how they would be spent. And there's, there's currently, uh, there's currently um, trying to develop a five-year capital plan so that there's a, a plan like we have for all of our other departments, um, what the expenses are or what the capital expenses. Are going forward so that you can have, a f you know, a five or six year look at what's facing them. And was Casper so included in on those discussions? Been, yeah, and they're, we're going to rely on their advice or take into and consideration has their been, advice. Has been jet right, has, has been completely been jet right. Okay. Any other member of the public? If not, then I would suggest that we uh, go out of uh, turn here and allow. Uh, representatives of Casper and Dick Hotchkiss, the chair of the Country Club of Woodbridge Commission, to make a report to us before we hear a 
lengthy presentation on the public works building project. So if that's agreeable to the board, mm -hmm. uh, Deke Hotchkiss is here. And, uh, are we okay. Ryan Thank Phelps you. and uh, Jason Beffer. Thank you. Jason's just passing out a, a brief status report on March revenues. We haven't finalized the financial statement on that's due to the top of the 15th. So we'll have a more detailed financial statement for March at our next meeting. Okay. I think under the agreement you're to give us a <coughs> financial statement is it the 20th of the month? Is they're due on the 20th. We, we typically have them out by the 15th, but they're okay. due the, the 20th of the following month, correct? So do you want to go through this? Yeah, what I'd like to do today is talk to, to uh, the March revenues, which we, we have in the bank and we, we know we're certain. Um, in March, now this is just part of a stub budget that's carrying us until the fiscal year starts on July 1. Um, so in the, in the 30 days in March, we uh, the club made $104,427 in revenue and we budgeted for $90,500. Um, memberships, uh, Came in about, I'm referring to the first page. In the oh, I'm sorry, it's your second page. Um, memberships, uh, we're about 4,500 ahead of our plan. Uh, greens fees, 3,000, 3,300 ahead of plan. Carp fees, 4,000 ahead of plan. Other revenues, referring to uh, bag storage, um, handicap fees, things like that. Um, again, a, a few, about $2,000 ahead of plan. Um, so, so March ended up well. We're excited about the start that we had. We, we had the good fortune of good weather, um, which helped. So we saw that at our other clubs in Connecticut as well. Um, the rounds were actually down. Um, total rounds, we budgeted to do 950. We only did 709. Um, however, the, the majority of where we were down, we budgeted for 500 member rounds, which are essentially zero value associated with them as each time they play. And we only did about half of that. We did 285. So the rounds that we didn't do, um, didn't really affect the revenue that we were able to make in March. Um, just looking a little ahead into April, um, through the first 10 days, we've made, we're, we are projected to end up at about 65,000 for the month in Green Speed Car Fee revenue, and we budgeted 99,000. Now, typical in April, we generally start out slower because the, the weather dramatically improves in the second half of the month. Um, and this is what we, we, we anticipate happening. Um, so we're, we're a little underneath of our green screen car fee um, trend in the first 10 days of the month, which is pretty, like I said, pretty typical. Um, and the memberships, we've collected $25,000 in membership revenue in April so far on a $100,000 uh, budget. That's, that's gonna be, I'll leave it to you guys to, to ask some questions. Jason's gonna take you through um, kind of a specific breakdown of memberships that we've sold thus far uh, compared to budget. Can we do that and we can ask the question to Yeah, uh, again, uh, seeing uh, some strong results on the membership side. Uh, 85 memberships sold thus far. I didn't count the two we did today. We did uh, another couple today, uh, pool memberships. Um, of that, you'll see we've got a very solid uh, 38 seven day memberships, which is our, our highest value membership, which is a good sign. Um, you can see we're right on right on track to, to, to knock that uh, those items on, out of the park on the budget. Um, what, uh, as you go down the list, um, some of our five day memberships uh, sold is, are projected to be down a little bit from budget, but uh, we expect that number to change as uh, some of the folks from Florida uh, come back up for the winter or for the summer season. We haven't uh, we haven't seen all those folks come back in yet. Um, strong junior membership. I'm excited to see that. Um, I think that will ultimately lead to uh, more dollars through the pro shop sales and uh, pool memberships as well. Um, again, you can see um, line item number eight there. Uh, budgeted dollars, 144 thousand is roughly what we've budgeted for pool memberships and you can see we're, we're quite a bit behind that right now but people aren't really thinking pool memberships quite yet um, 
it's not quite warm enough for that. Uh, we have given an April 30th uh, deadline on our rate structure, and we have been informing people that the rates may change, they may go up at that date, so I do feel like we'll have a strong push in the last three weeks of the month as people are aware of that date. Um, a, a couple other encouraging numbers. 40% uh, of the membership sold thus far are new members uh, to the club. They were not members last year. We think that's a very encouraging uh, sign. And uh, again, as I said, we, we really do feel like we have a very strong three to four more weeks of selling membership selling uh, window. Again, people coming back from Florida, uh, weather getting a, getting a little bit nicer, um, and our rate is very competitive amongst the market uh, in the market right now. So we do feel like this has uh, got a lot of potential. So, and just to clarify a little bit on what Jason said, when you look at the budgeted uh, revenue and budgeted uh, membership sales units that we that we budgeted for, that's taken from the 2012 and 13 fiscal budget. So. Um, obviously, acknowledging this year we got a late start. We didn't open until April, um, or we didn't open until March. The weather was nice all through the winter. It, it's it's very easy to assume that a lot of the avid golfers that would have been core membership uh, candidates chose to buy elsewhere so they could play golf while we were remained closed. So, uh, I think that this is great news for 2012 as, as the stub. I think it means even more to say that 40% of the, the exist the people that bought were new. Um, and really when we look at these totals, we're looking into next year when we start that fall campaign where we'll uh, try to attract new members to the club or members that may have joined elsewhere while we were figuring out what to do at Woodbridge. I think that that, that number looks good. And we're the, the pool memberships, we've had all sorts of inquiries. We've got 20 or 25 families that are on the hook that are just waiting for a uh, junior golf or the uh, junior camp schedule to come out. and. We anticipate that that's going to come in um, later on in this month. There's just no reason for them to front that cash out with the pool closed. What is the pool membership right now? Just the pool? It's uh, 1050 for a resident family, uh, 1200 for a non-resident family, 800 for single. Any questions? Um, uh, so someone had called me and played um, this past weekend and um, in the foursome in San Jose. Um, one of the comments he made, I, he told me just to I just express this, and I asked him to put it in the email, so maybe I'll forward it if I get that email. But one of the things he mentioned was, um, sounds like a couple really avid golfers, so they play around quite a bit, and uh, he, he said when they went to pay, it, like it wasn't, it wasn't such a formal process. It was, it was fairly laid back. He said when they went out to start, no one checked any tickets. And they were, it, I'm just wondering if it was that foursome that went through and there is a pretty tight process or, because he, he commented, it's a resident, and he commented that it was extremely loose in terms of no one was really asking, checking, not that it, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, well, do you want to talk about the checking process? What day did he play? On Friday? I don't know if it was Saturday or Sunday. Okay. He said he had a force and he said they were delayed in the morning. There was a legitimate Correct. reason why they were delayed. Correct. 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 We had a frost. We had a frost delay all weekend and, and so yeah. that uh, made things, uh, it's, we struggled a little bit with that. Um, one, we, we were delayed a little bit in getting our technology set up and it happened about uh, 12 o'clock on Saturday when I finally was able to get it up and running. Uh, so, as of now, there's a very formal structure in place to check IDs and issue resident cards. Um, we did have a starter on that day, um, but we, he was doing a little bit of rangering as well, so that could have been uh, the issue with the, on the starter sheet, um, but um, the system is in place as of now um, to, again, check IDs for residents. Um, we are selling Advantage cards as well. Uh, we find that as a very easy upsell at the counter, $29 card, 15% off for your fees, and again, it IDs them with a card, which is another control. Um, so the weekend, we were, I was a day late in getting our technology ready to go, uh, but we are 
we yeah, have the system in place now. Just to add to that, yeah, the, all yeah. the entirety of March, we ran off of a cash register that you can purchase at the Staples. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. I think that we got it. Um, moving forward, now that we have our point of sale and it's just uh, attached to the T-sheet, um, there's several, not only controls from um, ensuring that customers are checked in appropriately, resident and non-resident, but cash controls as well. Um, each customer that comes in is provided a receipt. They have to have that receipt to get on the golf course. There's signs at the counter, or will be signs that are being shipped that say, your purchase is free without a receipt. Um, that ensures that, that there's never any cash issues um, with, with frontline counter staff. There's also mystery shops that Jason and I are unaware of that further kind of test um, cash handling system. So um, I'd like to say that was probably just uh, growing pains a little. Um, are the golfers looking for any kind of food drink after they're done? What, what are you guys doing about that now? Or? Yeah, they are looking for that. Um, we were able to get the kitchen upstairs operable uh, at zero cost, just some elbow grease and some labor. So we hired a food and beverage manager um, and we are exploring options as to how early we can get food in and get it, get it operable. Uh, currently right now all we have is uh, bottled water out of the pro shop, um, but I would expect by Monday we'll have uh, not Monday, sorry. By the, the next weekend, we'll have chips, candy bars, sodas, um, as well as a light light menu as well. So yeah, keep it. Very surprisingly, food and beverage is almost more of a topic than the golf course. <laughs> to be honest with you, and I, I, I'm a little I was a little shocked by that when I first came in. In they terms of from the membership, or is it before and after? Uh, uh, both, all of it. Because yeah. those people were delayed like an hour, so they. And there wasn't any. One of their complaints was correct. A cup of coffee, yeah. and it wasn't a donut or whatever. Correct. Yeah, right now the the only thing we're we're waiting on is the food permit. So we we had to go through some um, cleaning procedures, and we had to get some people surf safe certified so they could handle food. Um, <clears throat> had to get some equipment um, serviced, like Ansel and fire systems, and have had the the. Uh, Health inspector and the fire marshal out there, and we're we're on the brink of getting that this week. So we're excited about that. Finding out some food at the club. We were excited that we the kitchen is as in as good a shape as it is, with essentially zero dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some good bleach and some elbow grease. So you plan to open the bar area, it, yes. yeah. it, and also uh, to uh, buy a tent for outings. Is that correct? Right. Yes. And so, and I understand you've applied for a liquor license or will apply? Yep. The, the application's in process, yep. That, that takes a little bit longer to achieve, but uh, we'll be selling food and beverages before we get our liquor license to sell alcohol. And you've hired a staff uh, <clears throat> for yes. food? We have a uh, food and beverage manager uh, who's um, on site. He's the one that's doing the cleaning, and he's the, the uh, he along with Jason are both. Uh, certified food handlers, which is a requirement of the license. We've also hired uh, two, or in the process of hiring two line cooks and two servers. So as soon as we get that license, we can open tomorrow. Okay. All the vendor, uh, vendor agreements are in place. We have our Cisco national account, Pepsi set up. Um, we just can't receive any of it until we get uh, food permit. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, just one thing. Uh, one of the biggest concerns I think that we had, had initially, or I had and, and others that had uh, talked to me, was the number of rounds. And, and I know it's still early, but mm -hmm. rounds are down considerably than what you had uh, you had budgeted for at this point in mm -hmm. time. Are you concerned about that? And what are you doing to make sure that the? Because I, I I think both Greg and I were both concerned. And we thought that the number was very aggressive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just want to make sure we're able to keep up with that. But right now we're down you know, 240 mm -hmm. one rounds. Yeah, it's it's difficult to when we, when we write a stub budget or, or any budget for a new club that we're that we're coming in March and April, a little bit of May, and then again in October and November and December. Those are difficult months to really understand what your volume is going to be. Um, one thing that we we have done a lot of at Woodbridge in the past two or three weeks is compare the Woodbridge T sheet with our other T-sheets in Connecticut, meaning um, uh, 
uh, Lyman Orchards, Winton Berry Hills, and Oxford. Very consistent uh, in rounds, and those clubs, as we mentioned, are doing, uh, every one of them is doing north of 31,000 rounds. So um, we don't have any concerns of getting to, I believe we said 28,000 um, at all at this point. So <coughs> the clubs are already, are they hitting their numbers for these, or they also? Um, yeah, but they're, they're budgeted on prior history, so I don't know right. if that would be in relationship. But I just didn't, didn't know if it was the weather or if it was no, the weather just here us. because it's new, but you are hitting your numbers. Yeah, yeah, and the weather helped us. I mean, there's marches where we might not get open, you know, in this area. Right. Uh, we really have also have not been in the position to market it as aggressively as desired because, well, for one, we didn't, or even now, don't really have a full car fleet. I mean, Friday we had Two hundred and two hundred and five golfers, two hundred and five starts, yeah. and you know, basically had to take carts from people coming off eighteen to give them mm -hmm. to people going down the first hole, just to make sure that you know there were enough carts. So you know, I mean, you, you need to be careful about uh, you know being too aggressive. Promoting. Right, I understand that. It's just you know, I just want you to understand that's that's one number that people are going to be looking at throughout the year yeah. when you make your reports because. Yeah. You know, it is, it, it is going to be more rounds that have been played there than no, the last number of years, or ever. I don't know the history of it, but that, just so you know, that's a number that's going to be scrutinized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to add to what Deke said, from our outbound marketing campaign, uh, the golf course, you know, since we, we really haven't had much equipment until this week come in, the golf carts, we don't have enough to actually have every golfer. If they all choose to ride, we don't have enough for them. Um, so we've held off on some of that. That's our offers and our emails and our marketing campaign is really just starting this week so um, all of these numbers were done by just essentially opening the doors um, word of mouth word of mouth yeah <laughs> can you tell us what your marketing campaign is going to be like the next couple of weeks yeah week? i mean we can i can discuss it briefly here we also yeah. have a tactical plan that we can share at the, at the next following meeting um as you know or as we talked about in our, in our um our bid um, data capture is huge for us. That's our biggest way of reaching customers. We, we like that because it's free. We can reach them via email for free. Um, we catch an email address from 90% or more of every golfer that plays Woodbridge. If you absolutely don't want to give it to us or you don't have one, we'll still let you go play. So what's happening right now is we're collecting all those. We also were able to negotiate with Golf Now um, to allow us to use their database in the meantime and send some messages out. Um, so that's one thing. We're, we're, we're targeting the customers that are coming to play us now with offers. If it's your first time to play, you get an automatic email that says, thank you for playing Woodbridge, we appreciate it. Uh, click here to provide feedback, which goes directly to myself and Jason. Also gives them a $10 off coupon to come back. So those are things where we're, we're trying to get the, you know, just existing golfers. As far as outbound, um, I mentioned Golf Now. That's our. That's probably the largest third-party seller of tee times in the country. Um, they have a huge database. We have been highlighted on their emails that they send to tens of thousands of Connecticut area golfers. Um, we're on their website. We're on Connecticut Golfer website, CT Golfer website. Um, almost every local paper is going to have an ad run with rates and a message that says we're open, we're open to the public, come try us out. Um, and that's happening uh, this week, this weekend, and next week. So it's kind of the two-week message. Typically, um, we're also going to put in some, some membership messaging for here, but typically what we know is that advertising a membership in a newspaper is not generally a very wise use of money because members, somebody that's going to play 40 or 50 or 60 or more rounds of golf at your club is likely somebody that almost 100% of the time, somebody that we already see and touch on a daily basis at Woodbridge. <clears throat> so it's, it's not something, you won't see as many membership ads or campaigns outbound as you will see at the club for the signage and things like that. When's the next golf meeting? Commissioner. Uh, 23rd. 23rd. April 23rd at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. At the club. Well, it'll probably be here. I think we'll be here because it's the same night as the, uh, the, the hearing, right? I would have gone to the club. <laughs> no, you wouldn't because we would have sent you the notice. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad you have my change it right now. Okay. Any other questions or comments? If not, thank you. Okay. Thank you.